Hey guys, so today I wanted to make a very special video for you. Um, I've got another World War II Purple Heart uh, that was awarded to a member of the 9th Armor Division. You guys know how passionate I am about that division and collecting and everything. Um, I've got a story put together for you, a lot of research and everything done. Um, it's going to be a lengthy video, so y'all please watch the whole thing and, and learn about this man's life and war experience and everything. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring you in. Let's get started. All right, so here it is. You guys know I love doing my research. As you see, I've got a lot of paperwork here on the table. And um, I want to tell you about this man right here. This man is Mr. Arlen James Puckett. And this is his uh, find a grave right here. He was born January 11th, 1921, and he died June 2nd of 2005 at the age of 84. This right here is his grave marker. He was a, a POW. And I'm going to tell you about that. And um, this right here is his registration card. He was from Minnesota. This makes, I think, two or three 9th Armored guys that um, I've got, you know, items from that belonged or, you know, that were from Minnesota. And this is part of his obituary, again, from a different site. It says he, was a, a, he served in U.S. Army Troop A of the 89th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron of the 9th Armored. Received the Purple Heart, was a prisoner of war for four months, and he shared his experiences with local schools and World War II Historical Society. There is actually an online audio uh, interview of, of Mr. Puckett from 2003. Um, he did the interview, and it lasts about two hours and 20 minutes. There's actually two parts to it, which total about two hours, 20 minutes. So if you're interested in that, um, it's very easy to find. Um, you know, it's a pretty interesting and detailed audio recording interview of his service and life and everything. And I'm going to do my best to kind of touch on that in this video here. Um, I actually got this Purple Heart from another collector. I'm going to zoom in for you. And uh, something I can tell you is uh, Mr. Puckett was awarded this Purple Heart. He got it after World War II. So th he wasn't awarded this, you know, during the war. So it was after World War II. I'm not sure if it was a few years after or several years after, but um, it does have his name on the back, which is something that he was very proud of, Arlen J. for James Puckett. And uh, like I said, I want to share his story with him. So again, this uh, was given, you know, awarded after World War II, but it is his original that he was given. Um, like I said, he was born in 1921. Uh, the interview is from 2003. He died in 2005 at the age of 84. So he was, uh, I think, about 81 or 82 when he did the interview. It's very interesting. Um, he was actually married on uh, May 30th of 1941 to his first wife, which was uh, this lady right here, uh, Leona May uh, Gabrielson Brooks Puckett. And you see she lived to be 98 years old. And uh, she was from California. He actually retired to California. And uh, something interesting, y'all bear with me on the camera work, is uh, the person that put together her obituary um, talks about, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Puckett. See, it says Arlen Puckett there. Um, says what they welcomed his son Gary in 1942, shortly before the Army called Dad to duty in World War II. Uh, and then it even mentions a little bit later on, she endured much heartache and loneliness as she learned her beloved soldier had been taken prisoner in Luxembourg, Belgium at the Battle of the Bulge, and she didn't hear from him for several months. Um, and again, you know, they, uh, they were married 30 years, and then, you know, they went their separate ways. But, um, you know, it's pretty interesting. Sometimes you can find information on family members' obituaries more than you can find on the actual person you're looking up or trying to find info on, you know, their actual obituary or stuff. So... Keep that in mind. But um, again, I'm going to go ahead and tell you about his service. So uh, Mr. Puckett originally uh, tried to enlist in the Army Air Corps, but um, he was uh, denied, and uh, he said they didn't want him. So I'm not sure exactly what the reason was, but he just didn't get to enter in. He was actually drafted and entered into service on November 6th of 1942. Uh, he trained at Fort Riley, Kansas, Camp Polk, Louisiana. He trained in the California deserts. Uh, during 1943, um, he actually went overseas on the Queen Mary, just like a lot of other guys did. And uh, something he said was the Queen Mary had barbed wire on it, which prevented, uh, supposedly, from soldiers from escaping or jumping off the ship or getting off the ship. Uh, that's the first time I've heard that. But again, he said 
it was to prevent them from getting, uh, I guess, getting away or, you know, again, maybe going AWOL or, or whatever. But uh, his uh, unit landed on Omaha, I mean, I'm sorry, Utah Beach. Um, and then he, he basically starts talking a lot about getting up to the Battle of the Bulge, which we know that started. The breakthrough really was December 16th of 1944. Uh, but he actually said about two weeks before uh, December 16th, his unit was the first to engage and kill Germans, I guess, you know, in that area. Um, and then he starts talking about on December 17th, he was on his way to the CP for orders when he ended up shooting and killing two Germans with his uh, M1 Garand at about 300 yards, he estimated, uh, using iron sights. Um, and in basic training, he actually, he, he had said he had been a sniper trainee. Um, he said he shot one and then another one came out not too long after that to kind of check on the first guy. And then he shot that guy and he, and he said he killed him. But um, after that took place, he was still making his way to the CP uh, when German artillery started going off near him. Uh, and he said that he dove into a ditch. And when he dove into the ditch, he put his hand up on top of his helmet to keep his helmet on his head. And he said an artillery shell hit the building just right across the street from him. And some shrapnel came and hit him in the hand, hit him in his finger, uh, which was, again, his hand was on top of his helmet. The shrapnel hit his finger and uh, caused a two-inch gash down to the bone in one of his fingers. And so that's how he earned uh, the Purple Heart, again, shrapnel in the hand or fingers. Um, so he made his way to the CP, you know, and he got... Um, some information as far as what his next uh, operation or mission or direction was going to be for that night. Again, this is the night of December 17th, uh, 1944. Um, he said as far as his hand wound, he said he just basically wrapped it and it healed on its own over time. Um, but so again, they got their orders December 17th night. And he said it was about 1 o'clock in the morning, 1 a.m. on December 18th. He was riding in an armored vehicle, you know, with some other guys in his unit, and they came a place, uh, uh, came upon a place in the road where he said there was a dud artillery shell that was sticking up just straight out of the ground, and he said they stopped, and they ended up getting into a firefight with some Germans, and uh, he said the firefight only lasted maybe a minute or so, and he said there was just shooting and firing going all different directions all around him, and uh, he said he actually didn't fire his weapon at that time because, again, you got people from all around shooting and stuff. I guess he didn't want to, you know, end up uh, shooting in the wrong direction, uh, but uh, once the shooting stopped, again, it didn't last a minute or two, he said. Next thing he knows is he hears uh, some guys behind him saying, comrade, and he turned around, and he said that he saw some of the guys in his unit throw their hands up and surrender, and he said that something he had promised himself before he joined the service, or maybe right when he had joined the service, is that he would never, ever be taken prisoner. He would never allow that to happen. And he said that he was so angry, just filled with anger, as soon as he saw those guys from the ninth, you know, from his unit surrendering, he said he could have killed them. He wanted to kill those American soldiers who surrendered. He called them gutless and spineless and everything. And he was so angry at those guys for surrendering that he carried that anger with him later on in life. And eventually he had to go to a therapist, not only for that, but just because of PTSD and everything. Um, but... He was very, very angry, again, at them. He said he was basically more angry at them than the Germans. He could not believe that these Americans wouldn't even keep fighting or anything. They just gave up. And again, that, that uh, I guess, haunted him or bothered him for most of his life. But um, he said a total of 37 men uh, were captured. Four had been killed. And he said at first they were taken to a house where there were only four Germans that were guarding them. Only four Germans guarding, uh, I guess, 37 guys. And he said that if he had been with any guys that had any guts, then they could have basically overtaken the four Germans and they could have escaped. But he he, he called the you know the other Americans with him gutless and everything. He was so mad at them that uh, you know they didn't make a move or anything. And so they were loaded onto boxcars and they ended up being strafed and bombed by planes. He said there was barbed wire on the windows, which some prisoners were able to rip off, uh, and they were able to climb out of the boxcar. And uh, he said the following morning, you know, the attack had stopped. The following morning, the Germans let them out of the of the boxcar. And there was dead American soldiers, you know, where, where out there, you know, laying out there where they had tried to escape. 
it was actually the soldiers that had jumped from their cart. I'm not sure how many exactly it was, but they uh, instead of staying in the box car, they wanted to escape. Uh, obviously, they were scared, I'm sure, but unfortunately, it was a bad decision and it cost them their lives. Um, he ended up being a prisoner for four months. Uh, he was in a prisoner of about four different camps, in, including St Stalag 12A, Stalag 3A, and Stalag 3B. Um, something he said while he was in a camp, there was a German guard that sat next to him. And in perfect English, the German asked him, what are we fighting for? And he basically told the German guy, you need to ask Hitler. You know, he's the one that started all this, so ask him why we're fighting. He said another time in a different prison, uh, prisoner of war camp, another German soldier started talking to him in English. And he said, come to find out, that German soldier was from Minnesota, just like he was. And he said, he told the guy to his face that you're a traitor. The guy had evidently answered the call of the fatherland and returned, but again, Mr. Puckett called that guy a traitor because he left the U.S. to go join the German soldier, uh, German army. But um, he said while he was a prisoner of war, he actually had two watches. He had taken the bands off. He hit them in his mouth, under his arms and everything, and uh, I guess they were kind of like good luck charms to him. He could keep up with the time. He actually kept a diary during all his service and the, the time in prisoner of war camps. Uh, that's something I would love to get a hold of one day, but I mean, there's no telling where it is now. But um, he said also in, in prisoner of war camps, if you had cigarettes, especially a carton of cigarettes, he said you're basically a millionaire because cigarettes can be used like money to acquire things, which a lot of us know that. But he was basically a millionaire. He had a way of getting cigarettes and just uh, doing different things to get what he needed as far as supplies or whatever. Um, he said that, you know, being in the service, being a POW especially, he said it basically screwed up his life. That's what he, That's the word terminology he used. He said he was beaten by a guard so severely that the nerves in his left knee were killed and they never regenerated. So he had he had leg pain, knee pain for all of his life. Um, he said he actually caught a, a, a bad case of appendicitis while in camp and another case afterwards and he had to have surgery because of gain green had set in. And like I told you, he suffered PTSD, went through to a therapist later in life. He received 100% disability because he had gotten frostbite, you know, during the Battle of the Bulge. So again, this man got frostbite. This man was wounded in the hand, or, you know, the finger. He also was a prisoner of war. He was beaten. He had his left knee damaged because of the beatings and everything, the nerves damaged and everything. Again, he had PTSD. He carried anger with him. And uh, he definitely went through a lot. My heart goes out to him, you know. Um, again, he passed in 2005, but... You know, a lot of these uh, soldiers, even nowadays, you know, Vietnam or you know, Vietnam veterans, Korean, the guys nowadays, they go through so much that us civilians could never fully understand. You know, their uh, readjustment back to civilian life can be hard on them, what they've experienced and saw and everything. So it's very important, you know, we thank these veterans, we get them the help they need and support, definitely pray for them, encourage them, uplift them and everything and, and be there for them. Um, but um, he was actually able, you know, after he was... Um, he was um, rel not relieved. He got out of the prisoner of war camp. The Germans had fled and everything. Um, he didn't say exactly the date of when he uh, left the camp. But again, if he was captured December 18th and he was a prisoner for about four months, I would guess it was probably maybe in late, I'm just guessing, middle or late April or maybe the beginning of May of 1945. They were able basically just to leave the camp. And they were they uh, rejoined American forces, uh, American lines in uh, Holly, Germany. He said, um, but um, you know he was able to have enough points to where he was discharged in October of 1945. Um, he said that World War II changed the whole world. When he heard about the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, he said he went to a church and prayed like never before. People were out there celebrating, hooping, and hollering and stuff, but he just wanted to go pray and everything. He said uh, he carried a Bible with him throughout his whole service. Uh, he kept it in his uh, his pocket, and uh, it was so worn out, um, the uh, the engraving and everything had worn smooth. And he said that his favorite uh, chapter in the Bible was Psalm 23, which a lot of us know that. Um, he said when he got home from the war, he had a three-year-old son. You know, he had gotten married, and uh, his son was about two weeks old when he was drafted. And uh, his son was three years old, and his son told him that he couldn't sleep in the bed with Mama. And the reason being because his little boy for three years, all three years of his life, had slept in the bed with his mother, which is, you know, Mr. Puckett's first wife. He said that his first wife, again, you know, this lady right here, uh, she was really scared of him. 
because she said that he would wake up in the middle of the night fighting and stuff. You know, he would be reliving his, you know, his experiences during the war and POW and everything. Um, he lived in Minnesota and South Dakota, and then he, uh, you know, retired uh, and spent the last years of his life in California, the San Diego area. Um, he attended reunions in Oklahoma City. Uh, he did remarry later in life, and like I said, he settled in San Diego, died at the age of 84. Uh, something I can tell you, though, is if you're interested in the interview, it's very easy to find. You can basically, like I said, type his name, Arlen James Puckett, in Google, or type in Ar uh, Arlen James Puckett uh, interview or so forth. Um, it's Again, it's, it's actually this right here, the Veterans History Project, if you want to look that up. Um, again, it's about two hours and 20 minutes, two uh, audio recordings, you know, one evidently stopped and then the other one picks up, but it's definitely interesting. I, I think it's well worth listening to. I actually listened to it twice, but, um, uh, you know, I wish I knew what happened, uh, you know, to that notebook I told you, his diary and everything, uh, his dog tags. He said he actually had POW dog tags, um, you know, his other, you know, war medals and uniform. I mean, who knows what happened to that? Um, again, he was from the California area. Um, he was very supportive of the D-Day Museum in Louisiana. Uh, me and my wife and kids actually visited there September of 2022, and it's a, a very amazing place to visit. So if you haven't already, make it uh, on your bucket list. Um, the lady that was interviewing him asked him what he, who he wanted to dedicate this interview to. And he said at the time, again, this was 2003, he wanted to dedicate it to the soldiers that were fighting in Iraq. And his advice to them would be to remember your training. That's what his advice would be, remember your training. He said that he would, uh, I, well, actually, I said, I would love to meet the, this man, you know. I'm so thankful to be the caretaker of this item. He was very proud of his Purple Heart, like I mentioned earlier, you know, and his name engraved and everything. Um, he was proud also he received a Good Conduct Medal. And what was special about that is he said it was awarded to him in battle, which was not very common in battle to be awarded a Good Conduct Medal. But you guys, uh, you guys know I love researching soldiers and stuff. Um, and putting stories together and uh, again here's another view of his purple heart you know it's it's very nice um, again he was very proud to have his name on there again wounded in action December 17th 1944 um, and I just have you know other random paperwork here um, this is his allied uh, allied prisoners of war uh, information see that Stalag uh, Mulberg um, he does mention like Lindbergh and he mentions some other um, us uh, camps he was in and everything again he he was from minnesota it looks like he was born in fergus falls and he was from hibbing minnesota um just different information here this is his when he was baptized he was baptized on april 29th of 1935 he was 14 years old and uh just some other information you know about where he lived and just different things later in life but anyways guys i hope you like this video um, I hope I did it, um, did him good by, you know, kind of telling uh, um, a summary of his interview and everything. But, um, you know, I'm so humbled and thankful to have this in my collection. Um, and, you know, hopefully I can continue to add a, more quality items like this. Um, but I would just advise you guys, if you do have any Purple Hearts, you do have any uniforms or medals or anything at all, you know, please take care of it, honor it and everything. Um, you know, this is a very, very special award um, you know, something that bothers me is when people say this guy won the Purple Heart, this guy won the Medal of Honor, or won this. No, they did not. They did not win anything. They were awarded it. They earned it. They shed their blood. They um, they did, you know, uh, brave acts and, and different things uh, of courage. And, um, again, uh, they didn't do it to, to be awarded medals. They were just awarded after the fact because of, you know, their actions and everything. So, again, you're not... You don't win a Purple Heart. You don't win a medal when this military service. That's sports. You know, it's not a competition in the military. But again, he was awarded this, other medals and everything, just like a lot of the other stuff in my collection and yours as well. But anyways, guys, God bless you. I hope you like this video. Um, I know it's kind of lengthy. Thank you guys that like my lengthy videos. I know it's been a while. It's been busy. It actually took 13 days to get this medal in the mail. It should have taken two or three priority mail. got lost and sent different places it was a an absolute nightmare to get this finally sent to my home today but i'm thankful it arrived safe and sound it was packaged perfectly and well but anyways guys god bless let me know what you think about this and i'll be getting back to you soon